Watch this. Idaho's primary season has come to a close. For some, with a crescendo. For a few others, with a crash. There were some surprises and some races only separated by a few votes. We're going to sift through the pieces the day after. A local option tax was how one Idaho resort town was hoping to tackle an affordable housing crisis. Well, locals said no, and now the city is lamenting that decision's lasting effect on its residents and its visitors. Imagine riding your bike around the world eight times. Now, this Boise man didn't really do that, but he could have with the number of miles he's put in on his pedals. Late night for a lot of people last night. Election clerk offices, votes coming in from all over still late in the evening. If Idaho May primary rolling well past midnight for some places like to four or five in the morning. So we now have the projected winners in all the races across the state, minus a few that may still see some recounts because of some close margins. But we're going to preview the November ballot coming up for you in just a moment where we can pair the GOP and the Dem primary winners. First, however, we're going to bring in chief political reporter Joe Paris to talk a little bit about this reaction to the election results and kind of what the votes last night mean going forward from today. Right. Let's start with the GOP unity rally that was held this afternoon. Yes, and this is a tradition that's been going on for several years in the state of Idaho. The Idaho GOP will actually rally together the day after the primary to show a united Republican front made up of both election winners and losers. We'll show you some video from the event. It was held at high noon today at the state capitol. Winners of the races are on the steps of the capitol to show what GOP leadership looks like. Below them, a crowd of supporters and supposedly the losers from the primary were there to illustrate everyone is on the same page heading into the November general election. You can see some familiar faces there. Now, we don't have time to name everybody who was and wasn't there, but to answer the question that I'm sure many of you are asking right now, what, ma what major players were not there at the unity rally? And I can tell you this, I was there. I did not see Lieutenant Governor Janice McGeehan, who lost the governor's race. I didn't see State Representative Dorothy Moon or Senator Mary Souza, who lost Secretary of State. I did not see uh, current Superintendent of Public Instruction Sherry Ibarra or Brandon Durst, who both lost their bids to Debbie Critchfield. And um, of note, Raul Labrador was there, but we did not see uh, his opponent. So a lot of questions coming out of last night and uh, to, to make it there today, only they can say for sure if they weren't there because they didn't want to be or if they were tired because of the late night last night. Now, I spoke to House Speaker Scott Bedke, who was the winner of the Lieutenant Governor primary last night. He is going to tell us about the divide and how elected leaders like himself are expected to handle party politics going forward. Well, I think that the last thing that we want to do is uh, engage in a war of attrition. I think that that's counterproductive. The things that bring us together are our love for the state and the opportunities that all of us have had here. I think that uh, we all agree that we have something special. It's the best place to live, to work, and to raise a family. I think everybody wants to keep it that way. We all want our kids well educated. We all want to have good roads and bridges and good water infrastructure. I think we start there. And if we get all that done, then we'll have the luxury to, to quarrel about the, what's left. But those are the things that make Idaho great. So did the Idaho Dems hold a unity rally today? No, they did not, and they usually don't. Party chairwoman Lauren Necochea tells me that the Dems didn't feel that they needed to rally to have unification because they already feel they're unified as a party. Now, Dems mostly had uncontested races last night, so not a lot to follow on their side. However, Idaho Democrats are keeping a close eye on GOP winners heading into the November election. With the non-traditional Republicans mostly losing their statewide bids, Nekochea says that she feels that voters took on extremism. Still, she says she and other Dems have concerns heading into November. Yeah, I mean, the Republicans had a candidate who cozies up to white nationalists. They had a candidate who doxed a rape victim and lied about it. These people don't meet the basic ethical standards for holding public office. I'm glad to see that those people were rejected. At the same time, we see a difference that's more style than substance. Um, we have, you know, Governor Little wringing his hands, but then still enacting laws that provide cash rewards for family members of rapists. 
Another major storyline after the primary huge turnover in the state legislature. A lot of GOP incumbents lost last night, meaning that the legislature will look and likely operate differently than we've seen this past year or in recent years in general. Um, we saw seven members of the powerful budgeting committee as well as a handful of committee chairs losing last night. Now, Idaho political expert uh, Boise State Professor Dr. Stephanie Witt. She has this insight on what the legislature could look like moving forward and how it'll work. I think when you bring that many new people in, you get a new sense of the direction of the two chambers. And in the most recent sessions, we've seen the Senate serving as kind of a backstop to the uh, right wing of the party's bills. They would pass in the House, come over to the Senate, and, and not get anywhere. I don't know if that's going to be the same. Uh, it looks like the makeup of the Senate is going to be a little more conservative. So we may see a more hospitable landing place for those House bills that in the last couple of sessions didn't make it through the Senate. So we'll see where those ideas go, Brian. And of course, we have everything and more on the May primary available right now at KTVB.com. Another great resource if you're looking to look at some political coverage, our YouTube channel. I think that Senate side is an interesting place to start looking, and we'll start looking at that, of course, coming up in January. All right, thank you very much, Joe. So with the primary election officially over, it's now a good time to remind you that, yeah, we are less than six months until the general election, woo, too soon? Well, whatever, since there are still four state positions that will have new representation come January, we decided to take an early look at who will be on that ballot come November. Starting at the top, incumbent Governor Brad Little gonna face off against Marsing Democrat Stephen Height. Ammon Bundy is gonna be on that ticket as well, who's running as an independent. Shanti Rose Davison with the Constitution Party and Libertarian Paul Sand. Lieutenant Governor, current Speaker of the House Scott Bedke, going to face Boise Attorney Terry Pickens Manweiler and pro-life, or person more formerly known as Marvin Richardson, running as a member of the Constitution Party. Over in Congress, current Senator Republican, excuse me, Republican Senator Mike Crapo hoping to win a fifth term. He's going to face Democratic David Roth. The independent Scott O. Cleveland and Idaho Sierra Law, a libertarian on that ticket. Congress, current congressman Russ Fulcher, ran unopposed in the primary, will face Democrat Kaylee Peterson, Joe Evans, libertarian in District 1 race. Congressman Mike Simpson will face Democrat Wendy Norman in that District 2 race. State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Republican nominee Debbie Critchfield is going to go up against former Idaho Education Association president, that's Democrat Terry Gilbert. In the race for Secretary of State, current Ada County Clerk Phil McGrain, who won last night, winning the nomination for the GOP, is going to face Democrat Sean Keenan of Coeur d'Alene. And finally, Raul Labrador, former Congressman Raul Labrador, is going to face Boise Attorney Steve Scanlon in the race for that Attorney General spot. Unlike the primary election, you do not have to be affiliated with any of the parties to vote in the general election. It's open to everyone. That's why it's called the general election, and everyone's going to get the same general ballot. Reminder, 174 more days till that happens. For now, though, as Joe mentioned, you can check out all the statewide results right now, ktvb.com. Well, it only took a matter of hours before a few of those who lost last night's GOP primary start sending out excuses for that loss, mostly blaming Democrats, starting with Brandon Durst, who finished second to Debbie Critchfield in the state superintendent race. Durst tweeted this morning at 3.28 a.m., mind you, at least 20,000 liberals disrupted the primary and many establishment candidates encouraged them, he said. The Idaho GOP must address its Democrat primary crossover problem, which is rich coming from someone who crossed over from the Democratic side of the aisle to the Republican side. Remember, Durst served in the Idaho legislature from 2006 to 2013 as a Democrat. Then within the last few years, he changed his party affiliation and crossed over to run as a Republican. That sentiment of sabotage from the other side was reiterated by Lieutenant Governor Janice McGeehan this morning with this Facebook post. Last night, Idahoans showed Brad that he does not have a mandate. Brad Little barely managed a majority, even with tens of thousands of Democrats and liberals infiltrating the Republican primary to support him. Not having a mandate is something Lieutenant Governor might be familiar with since she received only 29% of the votes in her 2018 primary election. But we wanted to focus on this. Barely managed a majority even with the tens of thousands of Democrats and liberals infiltrating the Republican primary to support him. Well, we reached out to Chad Houck, the current Deputy Secretary of State, to ask, were there tens of thousands or at least 20,000 liberals disrupting the primary? We talked about this before here on the 2-8, but here's what we learned today with some updated numbers. There was a bump, 
and about 20,000 registered Republican voters for this primary. So that part is true, but where they came from, that's where the nuance is hidden. Prior to the early voting period, 3,400 Democrats switched over statewide, 3,400. And 6,000 unaffiliated voters decided they were gonna lean Republican. So about 10,000 total. Now that's prior to the early voting period. When early voting began on May 2nd, according to the Secretary of State's office, there were about 550,000 registered Republicans in the state and about 300,000 unaffiliated. As of Monday, not including yesterday's numbers of those who might have affiliated right there on site as you were ready to make your vote, the number of registered Republicans jumped to about 570,000. Unaffiliated numbers dropped from about 300,000 to about 279,000, which is about a 20,000 voter shift in about two weeks. But it wasn't coming from the Democratic side. Chad Houck told us the number of registered Democrats barely moved over that same time period, maybe by about 100, and that's about it. Besides, these are the rules put in place by Idaho's Republican majority legislature and their closed primary. So it wasn't like anybody was doing anything nefariously, like out of the rules, right? Rules that have only been in place for the last 10 years, by the way. If the day after the primary is supposed to be about unity, at least those who have lost seem to have found some common ground anyway, even though it isn't exactly on solid ground. So there's that. An important step towards alleviating some of the housing crisis crunch in Ketchum took a back seat last night and a step backwards. While voters approved a local tax option for road repairs, a local option tax for affordable housing, that one fell short by just 7%. And now the city, the city council is headed back to the drawing board, scratching their heads, trying to think about how they can combat this housing crisis. Here's Katya Stepovic. An increase to Ketchum's local option tax proposed by city council to fund affordable housing programs and projects made it to voters' ballots on Tuesday. This has been an issue of where we live for, for decades, literally, and uh, one of the biggest problems has been the lack of funding available in the state of Idaho. The local option tax failed to meet the 60% bar it needed to meet in order to pass, resulting in 53% of voters in favor and 47 against. We have this one tool in the resort cities, uh, the lot tax, but pr previously it hadn't been, you couldn't use it for affordable housing. So there was a, a move to get this on the ballot to one, uh, allow these funds to be used for affordable housing and two, to then, uh, increase the amount of the uh, lot so that we could uh, have some consistent annual revenue to help with this this crisis. But now Michael David, Ketchum City Council president, says it's back to the drawing board. We're kind of back at square one and uh, it's really disappointing. We were, had a lot of momentum, you know, last summer. Literally, the, the country knew about the, the crisis in Ketchum. The addition to the local option tax would have resulted in raising retail sales tax from 2% to 2.75%, a 2% increase on liquor by the glass, 2% more on lodging, and a 1% increase on the building materials brought into the city. I think there is a hesitancy by a lot of people that have been in this community for a long time, too, that the, if we give this money, to the city councils and the county commissioners, are they gonna do the right thing with it? This isn't just a, a, a government body trying to dig into the, the pot of gold and, and get some more money out of people's pockets. This is, this is a, a last ditch effort to try and generate some revenue to build housing. And, and um, it's, all, it's all we've got really at this time on the revenue side of things. He says the estimated cost to fund housing projects and financial aid programs for locals is between 5.5 to $7 million a year, and the added tax would have provided about $3 million annually. Even that wasn't going to be enough, but it was going to be a start and something that we've never had access to in all these years. While trying to stay positive, he says the light at the end of the tunnel is looking a bit dim after last night's election. We're going to see more businesses closing their doors and more workers getting forced out um, in the in the months to come. Uh, and it just makes that hole bigger um, for, for the community. When your landlord says, you know what, I'm going to sell this place or I'm going to double your rent, you, you used to be able to say, okay, thanks, I'll go find some other place. Now there's no other places.
That is the unfortunate truth. And when I asked him why people would vote against something like this, he said, well, increased taxes, of course, but also that longtime residents worry that more affordable housing could potentially what it could do to their property values. So, Brian, right now it's back to the drawing board, of course, but the hope is to find some sort of solution to house seasonal workers in the area because what is a ski town without them? And it's all about this whole not in my backyard. We yep. want to fix it, but not if it affects me at all very much, yep. unfortunately. All right, thank you very much, Katya. It is the 20th annual Boise Bike Week and it's underway this week. Treasure Valley Cycling Alliance and other organizations putting together a bunch of bicycle themed events to encourage people to get out of the car and get out on the bike. In fact, the official kickoff event is happening tonight and the week culminates Friday with a bike to work day. A bike to work became more than just a one day thing for one Boise man. It was a decades long dedication that put him into a different stratosphere when it comes to dialing up the distance. Steve Hume has been bouncing around Boise on his bike for a bit. Not just today, but going back to when he was a boy. I probably rode my bicycle to school two, three days a week, you know, and then around the neighborhood a lot and so on and so on, took on a whole new meaning when Steve and his wife had kids of their own. Well, it was 1985. I took a new job that was downtown at City Hall, as a matter of fact, and all of a sudden we were a one-car family and we were kind of competing for who got to use the car that day. And to avoid that daily dispute, Steve decided to downsize to two wheels. I told my wife I was maybe going to buy a bicycle and she thought it was just another toy out of our limited family budget. I bought the bike and she got over not speaking to me within about a week. And from then on, I've kind of been a bicycle commuter. His commute was only about three miles. But I would take the scenic route quite often on the way home when I wasn't pressed for time, you know. Which meant those miles started multiplying. In the beginning of 1986, I just thought it would be fun to keep track of how far I rode. And, you know, that year I rode a whole little over 2,000 miles. So he kept riding every day. Yeah, pretty much. Rain or shine? Rain or shine. Or snow? Or snow. Did you set a goal? I kind of became a slave to that odometer, I will confess. You know, and it was fun to see those nice round numbers roll over, like 4,000 or 5,000. Oh, half a dozen times I made it over 6,000 miles in a year. Numbers he knows because he kept track. I've got it going back to 1986, month by month. By 1997, Steve stopped using a car completely. So that, seven years later, in September 2004, just before he turned 51, Steve broke the 100,000 mile barrier. 
That's a long time, 86 to 2004. Mm -hmm. Yeah, about 18 years. Still, Steve kept on riding. One summer, he even challenged his four-year-old granddaughter to pedal around to as many playgrounds as possible. And over three months, we rode our bicycle to 91 playgrounds, I think it was. But by the end of that summer, we were going to some nearby playgrounds, and she was riding on her own bicycle, so. An accomplishment only overshadowed by Steve's next 100,000 milestone, another 18 years after his first. That's a pretty good average. Yeah, not bad. And uh, it seems better all the time the older I get, so that's kind of a cool thing. What do you take away from something like that? When I think about the time I spent riding a bike, you know, averaging 15 miles an hour for 200,000 miles, that's a lot of hours. But then I think about all the hours I have not been sitting in traffic and uh, I've been just riding right past gas stations. That's kind of nice. 200,000 miles in 36 years. I have an age today, though, I tell you. <laughs> it's enough to ride around the globe eight times, or about 39,000 shy of making it to the moon. You're almost there. I don't think I'll make it to 300, but maybe I can make it to the moon. <laughs> Making that moonshot. Well, in case you're wondering, 200,000 miles isn't even close to a record for miles covered on a bike in a lifetime. That honor belongs to a man from England who hit a million miles back in 2019 at the age of 82. And he started recording back in 1952. Nin or 2019 was also the same year Steve retired, but that obviously hasn't kept him off of his bike, which he is now using his sixth bike over the last 36 years. Now, back when this quest started, he says there weren't nearly as many bike lanes in Boise and the green belt didn't go as far in either direction, but things have certainly gotten better for bike riders in Boise, he says. And there are a lot more like him out there. He told us on the very worst winter days when he heads out on his bike, there are already bike tracks out there, so he knows he's not alone. And if he plans to keep his pace and hit 300,000 miles, well, Steve will be 86, 18 years from now.
Our final moments of the show, we got this text message from Barb who said she lives in Ketchum and worrying about property values going down because of low income housing is just not true. She says the local option tax was poorly thought out. They need to take money from the existing local option tax and redistribute it, she says. Thank you for sharing that, Barb. Does Giddings keep her seat in the house, asked Bill in Boise. No, she does not. She is out and uh, will not likely uh, be in office in the legislature anytime soon. Brian and Joe, can the many of us across Idaho feel our GOP voters made a huge mistake right in Wazen for AG in November? Labrador will be a circus. Sorry, Ken, you can't do that. You can't just write anybody in. You have to register as a write-in candidate. It's not how it works. Have we heard enough about the debunked, stolen election the past two years? Now we have our local defeated candidates singing the same sad tune. You lost. Move on. Informed voter in Eagle. It's the same tune probably some of them have been singing for the last couple of years as well. We'll see you tomorrow.